Vietnam case, the North Koreans were already infiltrating all of South Vietnam, killing the South Vietnamese army, killing Americans. Right? They were committed. They were doing it. It was just a military strategy. It's all before South Vietnam. There wasn't any debate about that. So what Johnson was threatening was not to dissuade North Korea from doing something they had not done, but to persuade them to stop doing something they were already doing. And Shelley points out that compelling is much more difficult than deterrence, because once you've committed yourself to stop doing it, it's not so easy to roll back. Because if you haven't done it yet, there might be debates in the government and this and that. say, well, let's do this and let's not do it. So the terrorists and compellers have been central features of nuclear strategy. And uh, sometimes collectively, they are called coercive diplomacy. Coercive diplomacy. This is a term coined by Alexander George, who was uh, enormously insightful to the scientists and did the rain coverage for many years in that standard. Any other questions or things we want to deal with that? That's all I really want to do on the concept. Then I'm going to dive down to some data. Yeah. So, in the case of something like Syria, where you're talking about uh, chemical weapons stockpiles, there is still an order of magnitude or several orders of magnitude difference between the LP50 isolating and chlorine and the LP50 isolating and VX. Uh -huh. So when it comes to the behavior of the United States, right? Look, if if we have credible knowledge that Syria has a stockpile of the Egypt and VX, why would we even care that they have literally chlorine when it's only comparable to to the typical conventional weapons efficacy, right? As a as why would we care about chlorine? Yeah, as, as a, if if we know they have something like so, you're well, saying the VX removed. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. what? Uh, in that because case, the US, the U.S. wanted to make it clear to the world community that any use of chemical weapons was prohibited. Any use of any kind, especially especially indiscriminately against civilians, women and children, many of them were killed. Uh, and they didn't, they wanted to show that any precedent of use would result in a huge punishment. And that went by the boards when Obama, for other reasons, maybe good reasons, got almost all the chemical weapons out of it. That has the subject. So. Okay, so let me let me uh, go back to then to uh Catherine and hopscotch with some of the core ideas. And there's also a lot of stuff I'll add that was not in Catherine. So when we left off, you know, Truman had authorized the use of the two bombs, August 6th and August 9th, 1945, the only time any bomb, any of you have ever been used in that. Um, so we've had this 70-year uh, shell called the tradition of non-use that he says, and most others say, it should be preserved for the best of the Now, Remember, the government and the key people, the scientists, they're kind of winning it too. I mean, they didn't just see them as what they're this kind of stuff. They don't have grand ideas. So people begin to form in different ways. There's some government analysts, the military. In 1947, two important things happened. Many important things happened. But two relevant to our story here is that Donald Douglas, who was the president of Douglas Aircraft, which was a major producer of aircraft used in the Second World War. And it later became uh, McDonald Douglas. And then McDonald Douglas was brought out by Matthew Truman or by Bowie. Or Lockheed or Bowie. Or Bowie? Bowie. Or Bowie. It was a tremendous consolidation deal with the Cold War. So from Douglas to McDonald Douglas, who was brought out by Bowie. And, uh, Douglas Aircraft was huge in Southern California, and um, McDonald was in St. Louis, uh, McDonald Douglas became St. Louis, that's a 
uh, Donald Douglas, the corporate leader, said, you know, this issue of nuclear weapons is really a game changer. Bernard Brody, who had been an academic, he had a PhD in political science from the University of Chicago and went to Princeton and Yale to write and study, had already authored a book, an edited book, called The Absolute Weapon, in which he asserted that <clears throat> Throughout human conflict, virtually every weapon developed has been used. But in the case of nuclear weapons, their only utility was not used. And that was the way he was. That's what he thought about in 1947. He was already, you know, circulate, circulating around the concept of deterrence without necessarily getting into Donald Douglas said, we need independent people to think about this. This is really new, challenging public stuff. The companies don't have the capability. The academics are too, maybe too remote from the realities. The military, only, you know, their, their jobs to use the weapons they got. So it was through Donald Douglas's assertiveness that the Rand Corporation was established. It's the research and development. It was a purposefully vanilla name to camouflage, which are doing very highly classified military work, mostly for the Eagles, and a lot on the weapons. And for the longest time, from I say the late 40s, well into the 50s, the existence of the rank population was classified. Uh, a center was built for them in Santa Monica, California, and that center still exists. It was in the form. They also have offices in Pittsburgh, they do domestic work. They have a big operation in the course of the Pentagon. One of our recent going school PhDs works there. <laughs> and they have had offices in Europe. But in these early days, the capital might have that. Nuclear strategy vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union was by far the top priority. And that became more so when the Soviets detonated the Kurdish device in 1949, which greatly alarmed and surprised the U.S. intelligence community. They were convicted, I might say, at least 10 years, so 55 and 60, for the Russians to have the weapon. What was not known to the U.S. intelligence community, as I think I mentioned last time, was that the Soviets had penetrated the U.S. Alamos project and knew <coughs> virtually all of the things of the U.S. market. They knew the designs, they knew the material science, they knew the explosive characteristics, uh, and that gave them a huge leg up because it's like many scientific endeavor, you don't have to necessarily know the right way to go, but if a lot of wrong ways are eliminated, it saves a lot of time. Right? Because a lot of this work is, is it's trial and error. Well, there's a lot less error. If you know, it's to go down this direction. Now, you know, they had some people in the same the Soviet Union who wanted to try their own devices, their own designs. But they had this other program, Krichata. Look, we know that it works out there. Why do we have to reinvent the wheel and follow that? Um, and I, I think I mentioned to you this anecdote about Krichata telling the area. Not to keep sending stuff that they had to be in the filling up rooms and buildings. Um, in 1947, the other thing that was very important was under Truman, and Truman again is when he's a failed haberdasher, a failed farmer, the accidental senator, the compromised vice president, the uninformed vice president. <laughs> Uh, Truman is persuaded that they have to reorganize the government. Because this looks like it's going to be, they're in for the long haul Russia. This is not going to be some quick resolution, they're not going to come to some nice agreement and we'll go out for a beer. Uh, 
uh, but hopefully they won't be war either, and hopefully they soon won't be nuclear war. So we took into this long haul. Churchill had already come to the US and said there was an iron curtain. I can't use this way to find it, but I didn't know this accident. There's an iron curtain sending, of course, all the capitals of East Germany. It's Tibetan in the Balkans, it's Vies in the Asiatic. He even saw the small college, of course, Mr. College. And slowly, but uh, slowly, the concept of Cold War developed. It wasn't war, it wasn't peace. It was really <coughs> deeply competitive. Competitive in every sense. It was ideologically competitive between the capitalist system and the communist system. It was geostrategically competitive between two countries that were the big winners of the Second World War and controlled vast territories. Uh, it was militarily competitive because of these weapons. Uh, so, in order to grapple with all that, the following steps were proposed by the administration and passed by the Congress. A National Security Act of 1947 established the following. One, the U.S. Army Air Corps would be split off and established with a separate, separate branch of the service of the U.S. Air Force, with a key, the key role of managing the nuclear capability. Um, the chief of staff of the Army, who was General Marshall during the war, had to be altered to a multi-service uh, organization with a chief above the chiefs, which they called the Joint Chiefs of Staff, with the top person, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So there was now going to be a, a, a uh, chief of staff of the Army, a chief of naval operations, CNO, a chief of staff of the Air Force, um, a chief a commandant of the Marine Corps, all of the four-star generals or admirals reporting to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs who would come from any of the services. And they were sort of like the board of directors for the military. It turned out it wasn't quite that simple because there was a lot of horse trading. You support funding for my weapon, I'll support funding for your weapon. It wasn't quite you know, uh, just as it would be They decided that the U.S., which did not have a long, long history of intelligence, in fact, in the late 20s, uh, the Secretary of War Stimson had said, gentlemen do not use other people's mail. They decided when they saw Stalin, we better read his mail. <laughs> so during the Second World War, they had established uh, intelligence organization. The OSS, Office of Strategic Services. But there are people who will say, well, now the war's over, say, well, war's over, let's get rid of it. And instead, in 1947, the Central Intelligence Agency was established as a peacetime, sort of all weather, <laughs> intelligence gathering operation outside the United States. No, no domestic authority. Domestic authority, intelligence was in the hands of the FBI. And on top of that, so that's that's the US Air Force, that's the Joint Chiefs, that's the CIA, and they decided that the president needed a core group of permanent sitting advisors on national security issues. Because again, this has been a long-term problem that been that long. And that became the National Security Council, or NSC. The National Security Council was made up mainly of uh, vice presidents and cabinet officers. But it turned out that quickly evolved into an NSC staff of, of country and functional regional experts who really do the work, headed by the president's assistant to national security affairs. Uh, Truman had one who was not very well known. Us. Over again, many Cutler and Eisenhower, all 
also the first very famous presidential assistant for national security affairs was when John Kennedy became president in 1961. And he chose with George Bundy. George Bundy was a hyper smart guy who was uh, being the faculty at Harvard without an advanced degree. Amazing. The bachelor's degree in mathematics from Yale, summa cum laude. He was from one of the wealthiest families in Boston. He used to say that uh, the Bundys only speak to the lodges, and the lodges only speak to the cabinets, and the cabinets only speak to God. It's a very exciting group. Remember that while we were talking about I've met you, you can give you some stuff like that. Again, these are people I knew much later in that period. Um, and, uh, and Bundy became a key strategist for Kennedy. His job was to kind of integrate the views of the military, the intelligence community, the State Department, the Defense Department, and basically make uh, show options to the president and, and ask to make recommendations. Other famous national security advisors later were Henry Kissinger, National Security Advisor under Nixon in the first term of the Secretary of State. It's a big man Krasinski, who was a Columbia professor, uh, one who became uh, National Security Advisor of Jimmy Carter. When Reagan had a series of sort of non script um, National Security Advisors because he relied more on his cabinet. And then George H.W. Bush had Fred Scowcroft, who was the former Four Star Air Force General, and Howard Kissinger, still alive, still active. And uh, Clinton had first Tony Lake, who actually uh, U.S. ambassador to UNESCO, I think, in the Arab Spring. And Sandy Berger just died, died at 70 at Chancellor. But these were not attack figures in the street book, but they were the more important political supporters of the president. And then uh, under George, I'm thinking of all run here, under George W. Bush, Tommy Rice for Stanford became the National Security Advisor. And then when she became Secretary of State, Steve Hadley, who was a smart, very smart lawyer, and other political figures. So that ended the George W. Bush era. And then under Obama, Obama had General Jones firing a read comment on who he didn't even know. That only lasted two years, and that was not a successful. And then, uh, most recently, um, it has been Susan Rice, when she did not be confirmed to Secretary of State for President Donald <laughs> Um, I'm just saying that the National Security Advisor and the NSC would do a very important policy analysis to the threat of the So all this happened, and all this, all this was really set up in 1947. I'm 49 and the Soviets detonated, 49 the Chinese Communists won the China Civil War. In 1950, North Korea invaded South Korea, this was a, not a dull time. Uh, there was a major effort by uh, the Soviets to portray Greece and Turkey in 1947, which led to a whole aid package that would include and would trigger the U.S. global policy. But in the meantime, for our purposes, the U.S. is slowly but surely, and not so slowly, building more nuclear weapons. And uh, on the technical front, on the lab front, you're going to have people come to you from the labs. Um, I know many of you know this, some of you work at the labs, but not everybody does. So that program at Los Alamos that Oppenheimer ran, Oppenheimer ultimately left, and there's a whole story about him <laughs> and what happened to him, which I'll see for a minute. But uh, uh, Los Alamos developed into the major nuclear weapons laboratory. But well, one of the key things that happened was there was so much non-nuclear work in the development of nuclear weapons, and 99% of the weapons were not nuclear. 
So the proofs that had been at Los Alamos split off if there was a separate laboratory to send be a national laboratory. It was headquartered in Albuquerque, uh, but has a major facility here in Liverpool, 40 miles. So India does a non-nuclear work for the weapon that is the systems integrated for it. But Los Alamos was a weapon designers. There was a big brouhaha, which I won't skip you over, but it's in the Catholic book. I want to develop, to develop a thermal nuclear weapon. This is where Oppenheimer and Kaiser <coughs> fundamentally disagree. Uh, Teller was very adept at gaining congressional support. And he prevailed, especially through all this trouble, all the threats, all the problems they support in the Chinese Revolution of the War. So much so, and Teller said, I can't, I can't believe the thermonuclear weapons program at this happened. There's too many non believers there. You actually want this on there. So they gave him a letter, and that became Lawrence with more national uh, He wasn't the initial director. Uh, in Herb York, and then some very famous people have been the director, including Harold Brown, who later became Secretary of Defense. All these kinds of brilliant people by Dr. Brown. So today, <coughs> as same as 1952, we have three weapons left Los Alamos, Carlos Livermore, and Cindy. And they are under the nuclear, the National Nuclear uh, Security Administration, NSA, of the Department of Energy, which itself was only set up in the 70s. And they provide a technical wherewithal for new nuclear weapons designs and building. And they also do intelligence on the nuclear program that is safe. Um, one of the core things, and, and this is in uh, in uh, Kaplan's book, that's worth a few moments, even though we read, read it, is what happened with the sort of grand facing study, which was directed by Albert Holstead, who's another amazing figure who I got to know, a tangle with the way it's been slight. Funny story on my dad. He passed away about eight or nine years ago. Uh, we're going to develop a lot of really hot shots to think about nuclear strategy. And one of their studies in the 50s was to look at where the U.S. was placing its nuclear weapons in the United States. Remember, this was initially in the pre missile age. They were all on long range bombs, just like the ones that have been used in World War II. And then the, their successors. So, uh, a lot of the bases were on the coasts of the United States, West Coast and East Coast, <coughs> so that they, so the planes took hours and hours to the Soviet Union to kind of get a head start on their way to the Soviet Union. Because that was the only place we think it would be in the way. By the way, there had been uh, consideration by Eisenhower about the use of U.S. nuclear weapons against North Korea. We rejected. Truman had rejected, saying it's really for existential use. If we're threatened, if our survival is threatened, we use them. We don't use them in sort of limited or regional wars. Uh, the RAND team went to look at all the bases. And they said, guess what? You gentlemen have placed the weapons in the single most vulnerable spots possible for Soviet attack. If you wanted to work with Soviet targeteers, you put them in the best spot, you succeed. Congratulations. When America was thinking offensively, they were saying, what if the Russians that first? So, so this led to development of some classified studies, which nicknamed the Grand Basin Study. Most of them briefed it about 80 times. And then he got approval to publish an unclassified version of this. 
And this is perhaps the single most famous article on the distraction in 70 years, The Delicate Balance of Terror, by Albert Wolfsteader in Foreign Affairs, 1958 And what Wolfsteader essentially said was, that the Soviets were building up weapons, we were building up weapons, people said, ah, everything's okay, there's no need to do this stuff, you have the idea of mine, the Soviets are tough guys, people are not crazy, we're not crazy. In other words, things were stable. And he's and Wall Street reports said, no, it's not stable, it's very delicate. And if your weapons are vulnerable, if your second strike weapons are vulnerable, if your retaliatory weapons are vulnerable, there's an incentive for the other side to go first. If they can disarm you, then you can play a chess game of the strategies, checkmate. Follow me on that. Any questions? And this led to further understanding that secure retaliatory capability is an essential ingredient of a stable nuclear A quick story on the uh, years later, much less significant, but personal story. I got involved in this field in the 70s, so that's 20 years after he was very famous. And he wrote an article, and there's a new journal which now is quite part of called Foreign Policy. Foreign Policy was edited by uh, Sam Huntington, a very famous Harvard professor. And imagine it was Richard Holbrook. And I had written some other stuff in getting into the field, and I was contacted by Huntington and said, How would you like to write a response to Wall Street's article? Wall Street had written a two part article in foreign policy. Wall Street was one of the most famous strategists in the world. I was a research fellow, and my mother had never heard of it. And the title of Wall uh, Street's article was, Is There a Strategic Arms Race? <clears throat> and he claimed that there wasn't. They were racing, we were ambling back. Uh, so we had tons of data, we had data declassified with lots of curves and charts and all that. So it turned out they asked three people to write the drug so Two of them were already very well known. One was Paul Warnke, who became head of the Austin Trilogy in Senator Carter. Very smart, he had a lawyer. And he wrote a real uh, blast at Wall Street's personality. He called the title of Warren, which is possible, Apes on a Treadmill. <coughs> These are just you know, two insane characters racing for a And then he wrote a lot. Wall Street's view is it's very, you know, two sumo, sumo wrestlers, you know, one wrong move and it's all over. Going to below me, you had enough. Everybody 25 times over. Halpern yeah. also wrote an article, what happened is that one. Very critical of all said, with all kinds of insults. So I said to Huntington, I said, you know, I have no stature of anybody in my family. I can't, I'm not going to engage in that. All I can do is look at the data and analyze it. Okay. We're not guaranteed that culture. So I looked at all this stuff and I found that I thought a number of the things he said were exaggerated. I had no clearance if I didn't know. Uh, I thought some of them were plausible and a couple of them were correct. So I wrote that up in a piece. And then Holbrook was with me on the phone and he said, So we need a really catchy title from the party. Do you have it? So I didn't know what got into me. But I said, what about the title of The Delicate Balance of Terror? So he said, I like it. So they published these three articles, maybe six months or a year or after Wolf Hill. And what I was told later was that Wolf Stetter went bonkers, went crazy. Wolf Stetter, you should know, was a New York. PhD candidate at Columbia in philosophy, 
who left Columbia without getting his PhD because he determined that the advisor didn't know enough about philosophy to advise him. Extraordinarily pompous character, very small, and very self absorbed. Actually, I'll, I'll fast forward to another thing. In the 90s, I think, in the 2000s, Borsa had a party that had a heart. And he had a heart attack. And uh, I was told this later by his closest friend, the one. And Wolfstetter um, was told he had to go through another procedure. He had, I don't know, the all fathers flop. I don't know what he does at this point. So what his friend told me was Wolfstetter said to the doctor, I want to see all of the medical literature. And I will determine myself whether this is necessary. And he was, you know, he was a PhD candidate in philosophy. And he's pouring over all this medical literature on his kitchen table one night and had a mess part of that morning. So sometimes it's too much literature search, not so big. <laughs> uh, Wall Street. He had many friends, and many enemies, but many friends. And he said, I'm going to get, get this guy, especially not to this work. And he wrote a fantastically interesting piece. Huntington told me that the manuscript they got, which is just a rejoinder to the three articles, two thirds of which is devoted to my article, which is critical, was 90 pages long. They used to publish 15 pages, 90 pages. Um, but this title was fantastic. This title was Optimal Ways to Confuse Ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, No one could come up with a better way to completely misread what's going on. He's going to get every single thing wrong, some of which were, were correct for prison. And later, when he was Trouble, but not yet dead. They did a fest trip, you know, to honor a bomb on him. And they were so proud of that piece, they called that the bomb syndrome. Often the ways to confuse us. It was a huge attack on all its critics, including the students. <laughs> it's the one thing that happened, it elevated my stature. So it's, it's, you know. Anyway, so I can give you stories about every one of these people, but I don't know if you. But you know, the key thing was that Wolfstead made a hugely important contribution. And to this day, there's debate about it. If you have lots of pieces of weapons, then how many do you need to deter an attack, even if there's some of your force to all of them? Would a national leader, I mean, a military person, an intelligence analyst, might do it, but would a national leader actually roll the dice and risk destruction of their society over some? Know, gaming information or simulations or calculations by the general staff. I mean, George Bundy, that an SGA advisor under Kennedy said, uh, the notion that the U.S. would take any action that could endanger the destruction of 10 U.S. cities is so beyond what any president would think about. He was a big credit, critical Wall Street. They laid it out in a huge back and forth sharing of private information that would be very destructive. Two really super smart people. So, what's the punchline? The punchline is concept of deterrence and compellence remain with us to this day. How do you know when you convey a credible threat? How do you know what the adversary plan to do with this Um are there intermediate things you could do to make the threat more credible? Or are there other things you can do? Can you give, are there carrots as well as sticks? Can you provide uh, incentives as well as disincentives? Um, and this whole issue of secure retaliatory forces has been essential and essential. The next chapter after what I asked you to read gets into counterforce. 
or if you leave that for the next chunk, capital force and capital value, this is targeting expression. And other I'll, I'll say one final thing that I don't want to keep saying more about that. Um, as all this is maturing, this is clearly with a hot topic. You got Carl Black who said it's a fusion style and stuff like this being medieval, the communist countries living all over the place. So congressional support for these weapons was, you know, what do you mean? You got to it. And the other services said, well, we want part of the action too. There's no body of models that the Air Force has control of this thing. So particularly under uh, Admiral Rickover, who was himself the developer of the nuclear navy, submarines with nuclear power, nuclear power submarines. He wanted the submarines, some submarines, to carry the weapons that could be delivered by missiles. Submarine launch versus missiles. I'll get into all the acting knowledge next week. The whole lecture on acting. Um, and the army said, why don't we put some in Europe to make sure that when the Russian boards come over the line to hold the gap, they get blown up with our nuclear weapons. And at one point, this has been subsequently classified, as a goal, we had 8,000 short-range nuclear weapons in Europe, 8,000. And then our key, based on unclassified uh, information, uh, the U.S. had something like 33 or 35,000 deployed weapons. That's a lot of weapons. You see what happens with Hiroshima multiplied 35,000 times it would be there. The Russians had at least as many, if not more. So this became, uh, to the critics, the nuclear arms race, and the more measured people, or others like most of the nuclear arms competition. And the competition is not to use these weapons to gain influence in sort of the global geostrategic chess board. Questions, comments? Yes. I have If the war is on stuff, the nuclear weapons and the next time to wear it on, you would have to use the regular and the bomb defense system. But um, what concept was before your thing of nuclear arms race really space? Well, uh, so this is a question, why do you need so many yeah, exactly. if the destructive power of one or two is so great? Um, in, just in the struggle of the Soviet Union, each sought allies to extend their influence. And with allies, the U.S. at least was not interested in having these allies have their own nuclear weapons. Britain had their own. And France ultimately had their own one the allies. But the U.S. didn't want to have others yet. They didn't want nuclear proliferation. So they said, if we have enough weapons that we have a credible deterrent, that's actually an element of the U.S. non proliferation policy. Because we now know that Italy and uh, Switzerland, are both they were not in NATO, um, and, uh, and Austria and uh, Norway all looked at nuclear weapons. Uh, and the, the Japanese also. So part of the answer to the question is a nuclear force is needed for credible extended deterrence to extend the security guarantees to the allies. What I want to ask is um, just trying to like bring it to make the new concepts and the idea that we talked about in today's context. I get to today, but it takes me a while to get to it. Yeah. Um, and it's just uh, real quickly, like, uh, so with, during the Cold War, I think obviously everything's kind of leaked through the plans of what's advantages for the US and vice versa. So we do that. What do you say, like, really quickly? I don't want to like, yeah, I don't know if you spoil it later. So now it's, it's a much more complicated. Thing. Yeah. It's more fragmented. Russia is now more of a regional power. The Chinese are asserting themselves to that North Korean problem, to that Iranian problem, and to that ISIS problem. We also have working the destruction. Let me just say so next week, 
you won't have to enjoy seeing us. It's a holiday. Uh, President's Day, there's no class, the university's closed. That's the 15th. Then on the 22nd, Dr. Frank will not be available. I will continue with this discussion for about half the time. And then I think for the second half of the time, you might want to break up the group to discuss the project. This is the first window of class time to discuss the project. We'll send you some info 